Hello again, Sandwich. I'm Greg Anderson. You will have a brand new state representative at the end of this year. Do you know who you're going to vote for? Well, you have a choice of three, and one of them is going to be speaking with me today. His name is Steve Vixaros. He is the former deputy police chief in the town of Yarmouth. He wants your vote. Let's find out why. That's next on Meet the Candidates. I am thrilled to have this guest here sitting with me. Uh, Steve Vexaros, welcome to the show. Uh, I am thrilled too. It's very exciting, even yeah. though it's difficult times, but it's very exciting and great to see you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, we, we, um, we know a few notable things about you. Um, you are a demonstrated four-decade public servant, uh, most recently as the deputy police chief uh, in, uh, in Yarmouth, Yarmouth port or Yarmouth? Yarmouth, it's Yarmouth. It's all one, all, one place. All the same. Uh, and, uh, you retired in December. Yes. Um, on birthday, December 8th. Oh, yeah. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah. But you're also known for having four amazing kids. Uh, you've got Alexander, Elizabeth, Ashlyn, and Nicholas, who, uh, lost his life um, during Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, that is a very um, motivating reason for you to stay in pub public service. Can you can tell us a little bit about all of what I just said and how that brings you to a decision to say, I'm running for state rep? It's a great question. Um, it's in my blood. 40 years of serving the public, um, it's amazing that it, you know, it's been 40 years, but I loved every second and it was hard to leave. It's hard to leave a job that you love, but the passion is this, to continue to make a difference for everybody, you know, in a larger way, you know, the YPD, you know, Yarmouth PD, that's, that's my family and uh, they're in great shape. We, we, we have a great plan, you know, so I knew they were in great shape and, uh, and I knew that the calling was to serve on a, on a bigger basis. So that service of 40 years is very powerful and you meet a lot of people, you see a lot of things and you help a lot of people. And I think that, that that's my passion. Yeah. And then when you lose a son, you know, when you lose a child, you know, especially in war, uh, it's very difficult. And, but you can use that to help others, you know, so we dedicate our lives to, helping others, it, that's what we did and will do. And it comes in um, handy, I guess, in many ways, when you, when you suffer a loss and you overcome it the best you can as a family. There's so much uh, difficult times out there in the world. Yeah. And you know, we kick this off, we had no idea about the COVID crisis, you know. Let me ask uh, you about that. You're running a campaign during yeah. the pandemic. What does yeah. that look like from your perspective? It's, it's different, but for me, you know, I'm not a politician, so we've never done this. Uh, I'm a public servant. So in a way, you know, maybe somehow it's, it's meant to be because typically a campaign at this point, you'd be knocking on doors and going to events and shaking hands and raising money and all the things that a typical campaign does, but you can't right now, you know. We don't want to go to people's homes. We, I don't want to ask too many people for money, of course, in these difficult times to help with the campaign, of course. But I do have the passion to serve. So even though the campaign is still there, it's kind of uh, doing different ways of, of uh, campaigning like this, like Zoom yeah. meeting, like yeah. that. What I've been doing is volunteering, you know, to help veterans and and uh, children, you know, feeding basically veterans and, and children yeah. in the school every day. So yeah. in a way, taking the place of the kids. Yeah, Steve, let me ask you this. You note in your um, campaign collateral that you will be a full-time state yes. representative. I, I understand what that means, and I'm sure our, our viewers do as well, but why is that significant to you? Why are you making note of that? That's a great question. It'll be a full-time job, even though apparently it's a part-time job to, to many people. Many of the reps 
uh, have other jobs and they kind of do this as well. But for me, it will be a full-time job and uh, mission in a way to, to continue to keep serving like we talked about in a different way, use all my experience of, of helping people and protecting people. That's a big part of my uh, mission in, in life is not only helping but protecting, that comes naturally. And, you know, uh, making our community and our Commonwealth safer. We can do things to make it safer. And when you talk about the opioid crisis, you know, and you see all those families struggling, um, I know ways we can, we can make a difference. Give me some examples of that. I, I do want to talk about that. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in Sandwich, um, I mean, the, the Cape, um, the opioid is, issue. Talk about, um, as, as it, from the police perspective, I totally understand where you have been coming from, but you're going to shift gears, but still attack that issue. How will you do that? Yeah, you know, we've, experts have looked at this for so many years, you know, but when I look at it, it's not from uh, necessarily from reading uh, reports or studies. Of course, we do that, but I've lived it. So I've been to people who have died. I've seen them die. I've saved, helped save lives. I've seen the parents uh, suffering and the families, and we started learning to cope. So that's one way, you know, you have a group of people that come together every Tuesday at the police station who have either lost a child or have someone struggling. Mm -hmm. And when we started that, people said, oh my God, that no one would ever come to the police station to do that. Mm -hmm. And we said, yes, they would, because we're all in this together. So there is that law enforcement background, uh, but seeing the sacrifices made by families, we've had families tell us the best sleep they've had is when their child was in custody. Oh, wow. Uh, because they worry about uh, what's going to happen. They worry about, you know, someone knocking on their door that, you know, happened to me. I know what that's like. And uh, so we can dedicate our mission full time. Yeah. That's our pro priorities. And I think part of the way to deal with that is keep doing what we're doing doing what Randy Hunt kept doing and helping people but I think we need to get tougher on career criminals yeah can you can you unpack that for me a little bit because in in your in your material you do say um, you use tough law enforcement uh, as an approach give me an example of what tough law enforcement looks like in this context when currently when the police and all the first responders but especially the police risk their lives to arrest the drug dealer so they catch some let's say tonight red-handed selling heroin which has fentanyl in it most her all the heroin now has fentanyl in it and that's what's killing people uh they'll be uh you know booked in the police station and then they pay forty dollars forty forty dollars to a bail commissioner who reviews the record puts the money in their pocket that's their fee and that person walks out the door and they're supposed to be in court the next day i i would like to see that looked at differently Similar to domestic violence, um, I'm on the board of directors at Independence House. That's another passion. Again, protecting people. So in, a, in Massachusetts, if you violate a restraining order, you, you do not make bail that night. You have to stay in the police station or the jail and go to court the next day and let the judge review your record and determine bail. I think we do something like that uh, with the drug dealers. They need to get a strict message, a strong message that if you are, dealing this poison that you're going to be held and you need to be held accountable quickly yeah so that's one way and you know the other thing that is motivating me is you know the murder of sean gannon you know those officers they left my office and i heard them screaming three hours later on the radio and i was there when when we took them out and uh and that is a horrible example of the criminal justice system failing you know a guy a very evil career criminal selling drugs we can't talk too much about it right now yeah uh, because the trial hasn't even happened two years later you know there's still no trial a yeah. uh, police dog was shot in the face and uh and the law wouldn't allow the paramedics to to help the dog that was struggling to live so we we need to address those issues and and i'm a guy that can do it i can see that it, it really uh, as you're talking about um, this, it, it, it's very emotional for you. Um, it, it's funny you say that because um, 
I saw a man recently, he's in news, and he said, Steve, I knew you were going to do this. And I said, how do you know? He said, I saw you at Sean Gannon's funeral. And he said, I knew you were going to do something. And, and here we are. So, you know, that's not the only reason, but when it comes to that, I, that's where we can make a difference because that person uh, who murdered a, a wonderful human being and shot an animal, an innocent animal, he would have killed somebody else. Yeah, yeah. We, we can prevent that. If you get tougher on career criminals, not people that make mistakes, we kind of all do, but someone that, you know, makes a life of committing violent crimes and dealing yeah. drugs need to be behind bars. Let's um, talk a little bit about this pandemic. Uh, yeah. We, as we talk today, um, there is a whole discussion about reopen. What does that look like? If the governor called state representative Vixaros today and said, yeah. hey, Steve, what do you think that reopen looks like for your district? What would you say? That's a great question. You know, we've lived through something no one in our lifetime has ever done. So of course, I if if when we become state rep, we'd be talking with the governor a lot. Uh, governor Baker is a friend. He's a he's a good man. He has a good heart, and I think he's in the middle of a very difficult situation. So if he did make that call, I'd want to know more about the facts. But we're in the middle of trying to save lives and stop this epidemic. I see it because my fiance Denise is a nurse, mm. so we spent the last six weeks collecting masks from the community to bring to the hospital and yeah. we see that side of it but we also see the business side you know we need to get these businesses our businesses especially in our district but all over the commonwealth open as safely as we can because people want to work and the business owners you know god bless them they're they're in a very difficult spot yeah. one example golf you know here golf is huge on the cape and people want to play golf and and Governor Baker did uh, open the golf courses with certain restrictions, and we need to do more of things like that. So when you, you know, one of the topics right now is if you can open golf and you can open um, liquor stores, why can't you open churches? Yes. Where do you feel on, on that issue? Great question. I'd have to have more um, facts, you know. Be, a lot of times people comment because they saw something on Facebook or they, uh, you know, read something. Uh, you, I would hope that, you know, the leaders, our government leaders have, you know, inside information. So I'd want to know all the facts, but we were just talking with my, uh, yesterday was Mother's Day. So my fiance's mother, Barbara, she's a deeply religious person and she misses church, like yeah. deeply. So I would try to get those opened as well, you know, as safely as we can, because we don't want people to, to catch this horrible disease. So there must be a balance out there and we've got to look at the facts and get that done as soon as we can. Uh, the pandemic definitely changes everything and the discussion about releasing prisoners uh, to mitigate uh, COVID in, in the prisons, where do you stand on that? Rock solid against that. That is Why? a bad idea. Um, when, this, when it comes to things like that, we should listen to the experts, not someone that's sitting on the sidelines, you know, trying to file a bill or pass a law for perhaps political reasons. Uh, I listen to the sheriffs, you know, so Sheriff Cummings or Sheriff McDermott or Sheriff Hodgson, that's their business. Uh, so should people be released from prison a case by case, be, be, you know, based on their particular facts of this crisis? Maybe. But a mass release of prisoners is very dangerous um, without facts. So I'm against the mass release of prisoners without each case being looked at individually. And, and we know that when you do that, what that does, it gives the career criminals, again, not someone that made a mistake, but a career you know, evil person. There are you know, a handful of people like that. It gives them and those drug dealers and batterers kind of a message that they can get away with it and they're back on the street and they'll recommit crimes that's the fear of, of professionals like myself we don't want those career criminals back on the streets remember they're convicted of their crimes yeah. and now they're back on the street because of some you know allegation of a, of a possible disease they need to be looked at individually so i'm again 
you are running as a Republican. Yes. Uh, so I would be very surprised if this uh, next topic wasn't in your uh, talking points, fiscal responsibility. Yes. Um, where are taxpayers in the 5th Barnstable District uh, wounded or challenged the most from a fiscal perspective? Great question. That, you know, when I uh, go out and, well, before all this happened, you know, one of my um, best parts of campaigning was talking to people. So I would, you know, go to events, go to the stores, go to anywhere you could talk to people in sandwich. You'd sit at the uh, water fountain downtown and ask people, what are your, you know, what are your number top three concerns? Many of them said taxes. So what we, I think we should look at is every dollar that goes over that bridge, you know, from our district should come back somehow to, to be fiscal, fiscally responsible and do the right thing. We, yes, we, we need to pay our taxes, but it should be, you know, properly done and the fair share. How I see it also is, you know, as a police officer and leader, you know, we ran a $7 million business, you know, uh, our budget at YPD was around $7 million, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, putting people out on the streets, protecting others. So we have a lot of experience in fiscal management and uh, we need to be, I think in that same set of we spend money properly to help others and do it responsibly. Cause that is a huge concern probably for everybody, but especially in my district. Well, I would, I would look at this also as uh, there's fit, being fiscally responsible. There is being um, a good servant of making sure that taxpayers are, um, are on, the, on the right side of all financial issues, but then you've got the pandemic. Um, talk about needing to sharpen your pencil and rethink the process. And oh my. Businesses that are gonna be closing down. Yes. How does that impact it? It's huge. Um, I, I, think of, uh, I think of, you know, a business owner in town who, has done the best he can to keep his business open a takeout the restaurant became a takeout you know but you know what he's doing in the meantime he's giving away food he's feeding the nurses he's he did a, uh, a fundraiser the other day where uh, you know people bought food and, and enjoyed the takeout food but he gave some of that money to the sandwich food pantry so i think government has a limited role obviously like to be fiscally responsible help others but it doesn't always have to be government. There's people out there that can help others. And in this crisis, they're doing the best they can to stay alive and active. And uh, it goes back to your point earlier, we need to address this thing as soon as we can yeah. to get our owners and their employees back to doing what they do. And even ourselves, we people enjoy going out and seeing others and helping others. So that's what, focus on as well. You know, when I, when I look at the economic impact uh, and I look at our cultural impact, our lifestyle change, yeah. um, we're wearing masks, we are um, social distancing, but we also have a tremendous number of people, I don't know what that number is, who think it's all hype. That this is being dramatic in some way, whether it's the news or it's two guys talking about this, um, is this hype in your opinion? And how do you speak to those who do say, yeah, this is hype. This is too much. Yeah, there are people out there like that. Um, I say, look at the facts. So stick to the facts, you know, try a couple of things that come to mind. Ignore the noise. There's a lot of noise out there, you know, in, in everyday life, but especially now, ignore the noise, stick to the facts, the facts of what's happening. And, you know, work with others. If, you know, we're humans first. Uh, you know, as a police officer in my 40 years, I never asked anyone before I helped them, are you a Republican or a Democrat or an independent? You just help them. So look to the facts, ignore the noise, help others, stick to the mission. And again, you know, when you have a fiance that's on the front lines, I mean, that's inside. She saw it. Yeah. And, you know, we built that base at um, temporary hospital at the base. 
I go to the base a lot because that's where uh, we help feed veterans and things like that. And someone could criticize that, that that hospital was opened and maybe had one or two patients, if any. But uh, I think the reason why it was uh, built and created was in case the flood came in to Cape Cod Hospital or Falmouth Hospital, they needed a place to help them handle all these patients and keep doing what they do, which is, you know, saving lives, especially with the summertime coming. Yeah. So there was a lot of planning involved. It may not always work out, but I trust that the leaders uh, develop their plans based on facts. Yeah. Uh, let's shift gears and talk about infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> we have these two darn bridges, these yeah. two bridges <laughs> out there. Uh, yeah. they, they are uh, in, they are old, they are in need of repair, they, they need another life or to just go away and bring two new ones in. Tell me what your, if you and I are sitting on a backyard barbecue, I'm like, hey, Steve, so what are we going to do with these bridges? What do you tell me? It's a great question. We need to replace them. You know, they're almost, you know, 100 years old. You know, by the time they're replaced, they'll be about 100 years old. They were built in the 30s. Um, it's a huge issue. So opioid epidemic, kind of a statewide, countrywide issue. Taxes is a, always a state and, and local issue. But those bridges are a huge issue to Cape Cod. Tourism, travel, all those things, and a even bigger to the district. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's one of our top priorities. Uh, the studies show the bridges should be replaced. The federal government should pay for them. Mm -hmm. and, but there's a whole, a lot of other things that go with that. So when I was in Bourne, Bourne and Sandwich especially, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, you and I um, may go over the bridge once a day, back and forth, or once a week. People that live in Bourne and Sandwich, there are people that go over the bridge, those bridges 10 times a day. That's how they get to where they need to go, especially if you live in Bourne. So they need to be done right, paid by the, you know, hopefully the federal government, that's the plan. And as a state rep, we'd be right in on all those planning to represent uh, the people that live, especially in that area. So, so uh, uh, no critique towards, um, towards Randy or anybody else for that matter, but have, have we put enough of a shoulder behind this? I mean, it seems like we're still not clear about what will happen or, uh, or who will pay for it. Um, have, we done, have we not done enough? Because these bridges are old. It's not yeah. like they're gonna be in three years, they're old and that's the time to deal with it. It's, we've passed that point. Uh, he, have he, we done enough? The, yeah, Randy Hunt was right on it. Yeah, Randy is a great guy and he, you know, I wouldn't be talking to you, you know. I, I would still be probably, you know, a police officer and serving. But when Randy decided not to run, there was a chance to now take his place, hopefully, and carry on his mission. So we talked a lot about the bridges. And, uh, you know, the way I understand it, it's, it's just about approved now that it's going to happen. Now it's where. And, and keep in mind, it's going to take a long time. And it's going to affect those communities, especially the born residents yeah. on day to day life for maybe five years or more. So I think we I think they've done a lot. It's not easy, but those bridges need to be uh, looked at and replaced. Not only that they're old, but, you know, when you look at it um, back in the day, it was probably pretty obviously modern. But right now they're, they're really too thin, you know, yeah. and it's hard to get over them when there's four lanes and everybody's so close and. The right. new plan. So I would support, you know, the replacement and making sure it's done right. Uh, infrastructure beyond the bridges in the fifth district. What do we need to pay attention to? The roadways, you know, the environment, you know, Route 6A is a state road. It runs right through basically all of our, uh, the main, obviously, sandwich and, and parts of Bourne. The canal, that's an issue. Um, so anything to do with infrastructure, even if it's, you know, technology, you know, there are people with internet and, and different, I mean, you know, everybody has the internet, but there's different ways of, of uh, providing that. So I'd be interested in all of those things. 
making sure it's done the best that we can. There's a lot of companies that want to help out and trust the experts, but be part of part of all those discussions. You uh, have you are you have never served in the military, but you are uh, very uh, very much demonstrated your commitment to men and women in in service. For those veterans that are watching you today, young and old, why should they vote for you? I love my country, and um, I truly thank them for their service to our country. And this comes from me. You have a good point. You don't have to be a veteran to love your country and love veterans. My dad is a veteran. Um, he also ser worked and served at Otis Air Force Base back in the day. So when I was a little boy, I would come to Cape Cod from New Bedford and visit him at his job at the base. You know, it was Otis Air Force Base in those days. Yeah. And his dad, my grandfather, is a World War I American soldier. I'm named after him. And yesterday for Mother's Day, I was in New Bedford visiting my parents who have passed. And I went over and I, you know, I saw my grandfather's grave, you know, he died uh, before I was born, uh, an American soldier, World War I. And so that passion, of love of veterans and active duty military was always there. And then my son, you know, Nicholas enlisted. Uh, he fought in Iraq. Uh, he fought in Afghanistan. And, you know, he came home in a flag draped coffin. So uh, at the age of 21. 21, I, I gave him a big hug on May 15th, 2009. So this week um, is May 15th on Friday. Um, I told him what I told him and, and I hope that he would come home and he never did. I've never seen him since that day. Wow. I just saw the coffin. So when, when we talk about veterans and military and, and first responders and nurses and teachers and Anyone that really serves others, you know, that's a huge passion, passion of mine. You know, my son, uh, Jack, uh, he's a junior at UNH. He's 21. And your story uh, resonates with me. I, 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 I can't imagine uh, that knock on the door. Um, uh, let me uh, ask you about what you are hearing from others. You have your campaign talking points. Uh, what are you hearing from people that's kind of off script? You know, what do you hear at Stop and Shop when they say, hey, you know what? If you win, can you, can you deal with this or tech, tackle that for me? What do you hear from people? Yeah, I hear so much support. Like yesterday, I stood out for the first time, first time ever holding my sign, you know, in front of the sandwich disposal area. That was pretty special because uh, I've never done it. I'm not a career politician. I'm a career lifetime public servant. So to stand there was special and people beep the horns. They, they, you know, a lot of support. And when I see them in public, everybody kind of says, we just can't wait. Like, you know, there's people that a lot of people say, well, I wish I could vote for you. Cause I know, you know, we kind of know a lot of people because of public service. And like you mentioned, when you become a gold star father, you know, that put, my family in another world. You know, I've met and spoke with President Obama and Mrs. Obama in private for quite a period of time. And I've also met and spoke with President Trump and uh, Mrs. Trump. That's pretty special when you get to talk to two serving presidents. Mm -hmm. And it's not about politics, really. It's about um, being a dad. Yeah. What does being a gold star father actually mean? Good question, because people, uh, sometimes they'll say, oh, you're, you know, I'll say I'm a gold star father. And sometimes people would say, oh, congratulations. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they obviously don't know. But a gold star father or mother or family means that they've, they've lost a loved one in war, service to our country. So it's an old tradition. Uh, it starts with a blue star. So there's a little blue star flag that you put in your window with a candle comes from World War I, and that means that family has someone serving in harm's way. So we had in our home the blue star flag with a little, you know, a lighted candle, electric candle, 
And you, that shows the world that you have someone serving. And what you don't want is um, to change that flag. Which so do. we did, and, and it's very difficult. But we fight back strong. We try to re represent all the Gold Star families. You know, there's 16 on Cape Cod. So mm. when we Big Nick's ride for the Fallen and we come through Sandwich and Bourne and Yarmouth and Barnstable, we're honoring 16 um, families that got that same knock on the door. Yeah. And you're giving them uh, honor and remembrance, raising money to try to help others. Uh, but you're also giving those thousands of people that are watching a chance to cheer for their country. Yeah. I'm going to hit you with a few final rat-a-tat-tat -tat questions yes, uh, as we wrap up. Term limits, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, I, I think we should have term limits, yes. Uh, is Trump going to win re-election, or is he going to be sent packing? Ah, great question. I, we shall see. What would you like? That's a great question. I support the president, you know, uh, and he doesn't always say the things that I would say or the way I say it, but he's the president of the United States in a difficult time. Um, I'm a Republican. So let's see what happens, especially with this pandemic. It's really turn things upside down. But again, I'm not really about politics necessarily. I'm about public service. Yeah. Uh, but I do president. What do you do for fun? Ah, I ride motorcycles. Ooh. I just learned how to ride, uh, drive a boat. I never did that in my life, but I learned two summers ago. I love boating. I love running. We have a, a team, Big Nick. We, we put on our Nick shirts and we run road races. I've run two marathons and hundreds of road races. You can always find me because I'm the guy carrying the flag. I carry the American flag when I run. And I'm always at the back because I'm so slow. <laughs> uh, hey, this, is, um, this has really uh, been a pleasure talking with you, Steve. Um, I, I wish you good luck. Any final comments you want to offer before we, uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, just stay strong out there. I'm not sure when you'll be seeing this, but stay strong. Be proud. Be proud to be an American. Help others. Uh, and I ask you to vote for me. You know, I, I have the passion to keep serving. And um, we'll do it full time. And we know how to solve problems. And uh, we will take care of everything we can in our district and in our commonwealth and our country. Wonderful. Excellent. Uh, Steve Vixaros, uh, thank you so much for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. I'm sure we will uh, talk at some point. Uh, yeah. The Cape is a small place, uh, yeah. but I, I appreciate your time uh, and, and, uh, and your message today. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I also want to thank uh, the program's executive producer, Paula Johnson, her whole team. Normally there are cameras around me and, and a studio and lights, but I'm sitting in my living room. So uh, that does not happen. But we work very hard to bring uh, messages of candidates, people that you are considering uh, for elections. Uh, we want to bring any perspective we can to help in your decision making. Um, I am Greg Anderson. I will see you next time. Thank you.